good morning. We're so glad that you've joined with us. If you're new or visiting, whether you're here in person, if you're online, we, we're asking you to connect. And if you're here in person, we've got your connect card that's in your bulletin. If you grab one of those, if you'd fill out that connect card, uh, we'd love to be able to connect with you and uh, get you connected in with the church as well. Um, I think we've got a connect card online. Hopefully that's in the comments below and you'll be able to uh, connect through that. Uh, there is still online giving uh, that is through the website. You can go to shandochurch.com and give your tithes and offerings there. And if you're here in person, we do have our uh, plates are by the doors. So as you leave the service today, you'll be able to drop your offering in there. If you've not yet joined with small groups, we are starting up a new series this week. Um, and we would love it if you would be a part of the small group. So if you've not gotten signed up to be one, you can go ahead and e just email me at adamandshandochurch.com and I'd love to get you plugged in with the small group. As always, you can check out the website, shandochurch.com to make sure that you don't miss out on anything that's got, we've got going on and hold on to your bulletins, be praying over the things that are on the back as we have those different prayer requests there. I think that's all we've got for this week. So let's go ahead and get started. That's what I was going to start with, I guess, was this little story, if you don't mind humoring me with the story from being gone last week. We went camping in Arkansas, and it was, it was awesome. We stood on, just camped on top of this mountain, and uh, for one of our adventures, we decided, you know, let's go for a hike, because there's these great hiking trails. And, you know, when you look at a map of these hiking trails, they can be a little deceiving. Um, on a map, that hiking trail, I mean, is not, not far and uh, you think, you know, it's three small kids. I mean, what could go wrong, right? We're going <laughs> to, and Hope's completely capable of doing any of these trails, right? And we got some big, this is like rock slab steps you're going down. And it was, I, this thing was ridiculously tall. I don't know how tall it was. <laughs> it was a lot of steps. Let's just say that. Um, so we're out there hiking, and we also decided, since it was only this far to get there um, to this spring, because um, there was all these natural springs, we thought, we'll just do this. So we follow all the markers. We're being very careful to not get lost, follow all the markers. And it just dead ends at this tiny little, like, I don't even, it's like a trickle um, coming down the side of this mountain. And we're like, that's the stream, like a natural spring. Check that out. Um, wow. They, I don't know that they were impressed. <laughs> the dog was glad that there was some sort of water there, though, because it was a ways. And we also decided, since it was only this far, why carry water bottles with us? <laughs> so we get there, and the kids are thirsty. Like, they need something to drink. And, um, you know, our response was, well, we're halfway there. We'll get a drink when you get back. Um, which, after you've hiked that long, you, you're wanting something pretty fierce, like... Everybody's extremely thirsty, and that was our only response was, you'll get something when you get back, because <laughs> we had nothing. Um, ended up being a really good hike and um, enjoyed it, but when we got back, I think we all, that was like, we didn't care what else was going on. It was like, we need a drink, and that kind of led me to the scripture for this morning with some from Psalm 42, um, as the deer pants for flowing streams, may, hopefully flowing streams bigger than the one we saw. Um, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, and when shall I come and appear before God? I was just thinking about that as we were out there. I hope that just as badly as we were wanting water on this hike, that my soul longs for God daily in that same passionate desire, like I have to have this. So as we come before God this morning, I hope that you have that same desire, and that desire continues to grow in you, that I have to have this time with God. So with that in mind, let's stand and let's pray, and then we'll start. God, we thank you so much for your love, and that your flowing stream is an abundant stream that completely satisfies our life. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for the way that you take care of us and watch over us and take care of us even when we are weak and when we don't have the strength to carry on you can sustain us. God, I thank you for you, for your sacrifice of sending Jesus, and I thank you that we get to be here 
with this desire to, to search after you and to sing praises to you. So I pray that you be with us this morning as we sing and as we search your word, that you would continue to grow that desire in us. God, we love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. have to stick a side note in here because it's something I've already forgotten. Um, I forgot to make one extra announcement, and so maybe we'll transition from power in the blood that we have somebody that has, has been at our church that is going to be going out to spread about the blood of the Lamb, and that's Caitlin Donnelly. I don't know if you know her. Um, she has been here. She's one of our youth group kids. She's off to college, and she has been on fire for God. She has been sharing about the blood of the Lamb she, I saw a video of her baptizing a girl that she got a minister to that is in the deaf community as well. And amazing. And now she's decided she wants to take a missions trip to Kenya. And she's going with a group that's called No Place Left. And their desire is that there would be no place left that has not heard about God. And so they're doing this mission work in Kenya, and it is an exciting thing. I will put a link um, to a video that they've shared on our Facebook page. If you want to see it, it is, it is so exciting that they... They have a deep desire to share about the blood of the lamb and enable others to share about the blood of the lamb. And so if you want to know more, she is raising support. She's asking for prayer and financial support. She needs $2,000 to go, and she's already at $1,200. And so she only has 800 bucks left, which I think is super exciting that needs are already being supplied. But more than that, if you want to be on her prayer chain too, um, or to be praying for her while she goes in May, um, I can get you connected with her on how to do that. And I think it's awesome that, that not only are we singing about this, but we enable people to go out, our students to go out and to go to college, to go around the world. And to me, that's an exciting thing that we get to share this with other people around the world. So, Honey, I love you. You guys, that is our Timothy. Like we're, this is our church, right? And so our youth, just like Paul enable Timothy and continue to go alongside Timothy to build him up so he can go and spread the gospel. That's us. We just did that. This is one of our youth that is out spreading the gospel and now wanting to go to Kenya. Like we have the opportunity to continue to encourage and spur on that Timothy. Sorry, Terry Ann, that was really fast. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we have that opportunity to spread the gospel, to continue to encourage our Timothys, to continue to encourage and build the church. And yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Pumped. And sorry for that, that little intermission there, but we're going to continue singing. Sing it out, shout it loud, cover all the earth, let the sound of the
God is able. I think it's it's easy for us to think, well, I am able, and to want to take things in our own control, and I think we quickly find out that we come up short. But I think we need to remember, God is able to do great things in and through us if we will allow him. And I think I'm reminded of that in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where it says, where Paul is saying he wants this thorn to be removed from him, but he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I love that because if we don't admit some of our own weaknesses, if we don't allow God to take that space in our lives, the emptiness of us, how can he ever work in and through us in great and mighty ways? So sometimes it takes this humility that we have to face to say, God, I know I'm weak and I need you to make up for that weakness so that your name could be made great. And it's not the power of us, but it's Christ in us. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my right. 
righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love and deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see.
for the love that you show us and, and for the opportunity we have to be able to come and worship together. God, I pray that you would help us to, to hunger and thirst after you above everything else. God, help us to seek after you, to love you with all of our hearts and to worship you on a daily basis. God, we thank you for your love. We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. As uh, we come to this time in our worship where we take up tithes and offerings, this is an act of worship for the believers in Christ. So if you're a guest with us, you're welcome to give, however it's not expected. But if you fill out a Connect card, please place it in the offering at the back as we leave this morning. Jesus was constantly ministering to people and he always had opposition from the religious leaders. It's interesting in Luke uh, 16, verses 13, 13 through 15, the Pharisees once again were going after Jesus, and he comes back in verse 13, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What the world values is detestable in God's sight. And that's verse 15. <clears throat> the Pharisees' approach didn't impress Jesus because they seek to justify themselves in the eyes of men by how much they gave. But God knows their heart. And just like us today, it's not the amount that we give that God is concerned with. He wants our heart. So accountability before the divine is more important than the world's opinion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. But Lord, help us to check our motives and our hearts so that they would be in alignment with what you want us to do. Not for our own glory, but for you. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. John MacArthur, on a tape on Ephesians 5, gave this illustration that the sum total of man's knowledge, he represented it in this way. He said, 
all of mankind up to about 1845, uh, man's knowledge would equal about one inch. And then he said, from 1845 to 1945, all of man's knowledge accumulated would probably be the equivalent of three inches. But he said this, he said, man's knowledge from 1945 to even 1976 would equal the Empire State Building. I mean, the, the Washington Monument, Empire State Building. Washington Monument. And it's interesting, the comparisons of knowledge, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm looking at this thinking, you know, marriage is an awful lot like this. <laughs> uh, we got two getting married uh, in, in next month and a month after that, and I'm thinking, you know, that if, if we only knew then what we know now, but uh, our world is undergoing an incredible amount of information influx. So much so that we really, nobody can really keep up with the information that, that we're, 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 we're getting day after day. We're in an information age, and there's no evidence that that information is slowing down. But it's interesting that even though we're in the information age, and even though we have so much information today, it seems that our understanding of God has not increased. As a matter of fact, we'd almost think that our relationship with God is just the opposite. And over the years, it's going down from the Washington Monument down to one inch. It seems that people are knowing less and less about God. An unknown author said this. They said, we want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. A senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see young people enjoying themselves. And whose plan for the universe was simply that it might be truly said at the end of the day, a good time was had by all. That's what some people are thinking God is. What does it mean to know God? We're going to be looking at uh, Philippians chapter 3, and, and I'm going to look at verse 7 through 10. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Now, this morning, I just want to focus on those last two verses, verses 9 and 10. Because in here, I believe that Paul provides us with some vital information on what it actually means to know God. So how do we know God? Now, I ask that question, and that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. What I'm not talking about is knowing about God. We all know about God. There, there is a God. If I were to mention God, nobody's going to say, well, what do you, what's that? In uh, Matthew 7, 23, that I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. This is God saying to the people, Depart from me, I never knew you. Yeah, God knows everybody. But the knowing that he's talking about here is not just knowing about. This knowing is a, is a relationship. This knowing is, is an intimate relationship that says, I understand you and you influence me in a very personal way. 
And so with, when it comes to knowing God, there's knowing about God and then there's a relationship. This morning I'm going to be talking about the relationship when I talk about knowing God. There are at least three things involved from Philippians 3, 9, and 10. There are at least three things involved when it comes to knowing God. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. In your bulletins, we have blanks to fill out. The first thing that is involved in knowing God is righteousness. When we think of righteousness, we think of uh, being right with God. The definition that I've used of righteousness is satisfying the requirements of the law. There is something about righteousness that, that is obedient. God has always intended for his people to be righteous. He's always intended for his people to follow his laws. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. God gave us the commands, not as just something to say, but something to follow. God likes it when we follow his commands. In Genesis 4, 7, God is talking to, to Cain. And he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. From, the, from, from even back to Genesis, God really wants us to obey his commands. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to live a righteous life. There are a lot of people who, who live pretty good lives. There's a lot of people that live lives that, that some would even call righteous. They don't get into trouble. They're patient and kind with people. They, they help out. They, they even give to, to, to the needy and they, they volunteer for things. And there are people that would, you know, some even in the church would call them, well, they're a really good Christian because they're generous and they're kind and they're pleasant and they don't speak a bad word about anybody. They strive to do what is right and they strive to be a good person. But people like that can still not know God. Because it's not just about righteousness. No, in our passage in Philippians 3, it's about righteousness that comes by faith. It's a specific righteousness. It's not any old righteousness will do. It's a specific righteousness. Now, the, the thing is that, that the difference between the two, just plain old righteous, doing what, what you think is right, and actually being righteous as a, as a basis of faith, the difference between the two may not be obvious on the outside, but it is clearly obvious on the inside. Because righteousness by the law says that I've earned this, I'm earning something, and righteousness by the faith, well, it knows something else. It understands Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. A person whose righteousness is by his faith in God understands this first, that no one's righteous. Nobody has earned it. Nobody's deserved it. Righteousness by faith is something that doesn't mean that we've earned, that it's imputed, like, like Abraham, his faith, it was imputed, right? He didn't deserve it. Our righteousness is not our own righteousness. It is a righteousness that comes on the basis of faith. And so in order to have the righteousness by faith, it requires humility. We have nothing to brag about ourselves. Look at what I've done. I did this good thing. I, I, I went overseas and I fed the hungry. And, and, and I did this and I built, I built shelters. And I did all this work for nothing to brag about. 
No, when you're righteousness by faith, there's nothing. First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. Knowing God, a part of that is righteousness by faith with humility. Number two, knowing God also involves power. And when we think of power, um, I think a supernatural ability to change things. When I think of power, I say something that, that can change things in a big way. In Luke 1, 37, for nothing is impossible with God. And when I think of power, I think of God. He can do anything he wants to do. There is nothing that he is too weak that he can't accomplish. We're still discovering the works of his hand through the larger telescopes and the pictures that we get from the Hubble Space Telescope. We're, we're getting pictures of this all the time, seeing the power of God. Problem is, a lot of people, well, they view God like a genie in a bottle. God has all this power, and, and we just have to, to figure out how to tap into it. Now, with a genie in a bottle, we have to rub the bottle, we get three wishes. But with the Lord God, he's not living in a bottle. But we still have to figure out how do we stroke God the right way to get the wishes that we want. And a lot of people view God that way. So when they think of power, they think of how do I get God to do that for me that I want him to do. And so there's a lot of people that talk about God's power. How they rely on it and how they, they, they use it all the time. And, and uh, you know, God got me through this day. And, and these people talk a lot about God's power. But even sometimes those people who talk a lot about God's power still do not know God. And the reason that they don't know God is because it's a particular power. It is the power of his resurrection. It's not any old power. It's not the fact that God can just do anything he wants to do. It is a specific power. I'll try to describe that power. In Matthew 17, 20, he replied, Because you have so little faith, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. You know, I think of move, mountains moving, I think of uh, explosions, volcanoes. <laughs> and yeah, mountains do move, but I don't see it. I've never seen this. I've never seen mountains move. I don't see it happening a lot of times. But I think that Jesus is talking about something other than literal mountains moving when he talks about our faith moving mountains. You see, I, I think when it comes to the mountains, I think that, that your faith can move mountains and, and it may literal move mountains. But I also think it's it's, it's allegory as well. I think, I think that Jesus is also telling us that the mountains in your life, if you are faithful, you'll be able to move them. Do you know what the biggest mountain is in our lives? The mountain that we have caused by our sin. We've caused sin. We have, we've, we've, we're, none of us are righteous. We've all fallen short of God's glory. We have caused this sin. And so the greatest mountain we will ever face is sin. Not only our sin, but the sins of others. So in order to have the power of the, to know the power of the resurrection, I believe it's important, imperative that we understand forgiveness. Forgiveness, I believe, is what resurrection power is really about. It's not about God showing off his ability to bring somebody back to life. It's not about God trying to show off that he's all powerful. It's God telling us that what Jesus did on the cross was true, that we, are, we can actually be forgiven of our sins. 
that we can have a hope of eternal life. So when we know the power of his resurrection, what we're saying is we are knowing God's forgiveness. I think Luke expressed this in Acts. In Acts 13, 36. When David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried in his father, with his fathers, and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my brothers, if you want to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. You see, right here, it's tied the resurrection to forgiveness. When we understand the power of his resurrection, that's when we really understand God's forgiveness. It ties those things together. The third thing, knowing God also involves fellowship. And when we think of fellowship, we think of a group of people huddling together. We think of a camaraderie that happens, a sense of belonging. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord is faithful. You know, there are just people that are just fun to be around. There are people that when, when you see them, even in a crowd, they make you feel welcome. And that fellowship feels good. And they could be extra kind and, and, and gentle with people and, and very inclusive. But I will say this, it's not just fellowship that causes us to know God. They still might not know God. You see, it's a, a specific fellowship. It is a fellowship of his suffering. And the difference between just regular fellowship and fellowship of his suffering is simple, the common denominator. You see, when it's just fellowship, then we are the center of attention. And then it's all about us, and it's all about us feeling good, and it's about, you know, the, how much food is fixed and how good it is, how good of a time we have. But the fellowship of God's suffering is a little bit different. See, it's not about the good time that we have. It is about being able to share in his suffering. And the attention is on him and not so much us. Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. 1 Peter 4, 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. There is a certain bond. There is a certain fellowship. There is a certain camaraderie with soldiers who have been in the battle. I've seen it in, in, with you guys. There is something about going into battle and putting your life on the line for our country that bonds people together. I didn't do that, but I see it. I understand that it's there. But I tell you what, that's the closest thing that I can describe when it comes to the bond or the fellowship of his suffering. Because people who have suffered for Christ, for Christ's sake, well, there's, there's, there's a different bond there. There's a fellowship there that is a very strong fellowship. And in order to have that fellowship, we need thankfulness. James 1, 2, and 3, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face Trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Verse 4, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, 
lacking, not lacking anything. We get to share in his suffering when we suffer with him. The suffering that, that happens, not because we do what we want to do, but because we do the things that God wants us to do. Something special about that. It is a privilege, not a curse. In Colossians 2, 6-7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. In order to share in the fellowship of his suffering, we need that. So let's look at it. We have righteousness, power, and we have fellowship. These are the things that were written so that we may know God, so that we may have a relationship with Him. But knowing is not enough. Just knowing it. You see, we need humility in order to know righteousness. You see, without righteousness, then it's self-righteousness, and it's righteousness by the law. And we're not going to understand this righteousness unless we are humble. The second thing, we need forgiveness to know the power of his resurrection. Because that's really what it's about. Yeah, God's able to do a lot of things, but he chose to raise his son from the dead to demonstrate his forgiveness and the love that he has for us. And for fellowship, we need thankfulness. Because fellowship without thankfulness is very self-centered. And it's not real fellowship. It's not drawing us closer to God. It's drawing us closer to ourselves. H.G. Wells. He wrote uh, The Time Machine, The Invisible Man, The War of the Worlds, among other things. He made this statement, and I thought it was a very profound statement. He said, religion is the first thing and the last thing. And until man has found God and been found by God, he begins at the end, at the beginning, he begins at no beginning and works to no end. He may have fellowships, his partial loyalties, his scraps of honor. But all these things fall into place and life falls into place only with God. Now, I know it's a long quote. Should have printed it. Sorry, I didn't. Let me read it again. Religion is the first thing and the last thing. And until a man has found God and has been found by God, he begins at no beginning and he works to no end. He may have friendships, his partial loyalties, his scraps of honor, but all these fall into place and life falls into place only with God. And I, I, I read that and I said, what a profound statement. That's it. But even though he said a profound statement like that, there's no evidence that he knew God. There's no evidence that he found his place. There's no evidence that he had any honor to God. As a matter of fact, there's evidence to the contrary. And this is a perfect example. It's not enough to know about God. It's not enough to know about the information. It's about living a life of humility, of forgiveness, and thankfulness. 
You want to know God? Read his word and do these things. You know, we sing nothing but the blood. It's not about singing about the blood. It's not about the idea of the blood. It is about the actual blood that was spilled on that cross that saves us. That covers our sins. And so we want to know God. We got to step out of the idea. And into the actual. And we got to prepare our hearts. To be able to know him. You see, it's not just about information. It's about how we live our lives. Humility, forgiveness, thankfulness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you have allowed yourself to be known by us. Lord, help us to not be satisfied with just knowing about you. Help us to not be satisfied with the information that makes us feel good. But Lord, help us to know you the way that you want to know us, that we have a relationship with you, that we are drawn to you. But Lord, I ask that you prepare our hearts that we can know you, that we not take knowing you for granted, that we not be careless about it, but they, we are drawn to you, that we might be a people after your own heart. So Lord, help us to know you more. And Lord, we know that our relationship with you is like an inch. But Lord, we want the, the Washington Monument and even more. So help us to get there. Help us to repent from the sin that we need to repent from and change our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of decision, nothing but the blood. Let's stand and let's sing. Good morning, and welcome to our time of communion. We welcome all believers to partake. The emblems will be taken at the tables around the sanctuary. Please remain quiet to allow for everyone to reflect and pray. I have a morning devotional that kind of caught my eye recently, and it tells them a, an account of some Turkish shepherds. They were eating breakfast, and they see one of their sheep jump off a 45-foot cliff. The stunned shepherds then watched in amazement while the rest of the 1,500 sheep uh, mindlessly went over the cliff as well. The only good news was that the last 1,000 were cushioned in their fall by the, the ones who went first. The Bible oftentimes refers to us as sheep. 
We are easily distracted and subject to group influence. We would rather follow the crowd than the wisdom of the good shepherd. Jesus knows this. And in John 10, 14 through 15, it says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay, my, lay down my life for my sheep. So we all like sheep have gone astray and Jesus knows this and desires for us to know him so that we can be covered by his sacrifice. So the big question is, who are you following? One another? Self-centered sheep herders? Or the voice of the good shepherd that has laid down his life to save yours? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the body and the blood. We thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice that he was for us. And Lord, we pray that we can be sheep that hear and follow the good shepherd. Lord, as we partake today, let us just re reflect and let us uh, repent from every sin. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.